Well, we're going to continue with the series we've been doing on the book of Daniel. And today we're up to part eight. And last week we looked at some of those more tricky chapters of the Bible, chapter seven and chapter eight, uh, the prophecy chapters that uh, speak of future prophecies and events that would take place, some of which have already happened and some which will still happen towards the end of time. Uh, today we're going to dig into chapter nine. And chapter 9 is divided into two sections. Uh, the first half is, is a wonderful prayer that Daniel prays on behalf of his nation and the people of his country. And then the second half of Daniel is again one of those interesting and quite tricky prophetic passages that pertains both to the first and the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And uh, so let's dig right in from Daniel 9 verse 1. It, it, the Bible says it was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahusserus, who became king of the Babylonians. Uh, this is about 583 BC. Daniel, again, is probably about 80 years old. And uh, this event took place probably about two or three years before Daniel ended up in the lion's den. Verse 2 says, during the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord, as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and sprinkled myself with ashes. A couple of things we see about Daniel here. Firstly, is that Daniel was a man of the word. I don't know if you know that to be true. He was a man of the word. Daniel gained wisdom. He gained insight. He gained understanding. And simply because the word was his greatest teacher. Now, you know, I'm grateful for books. I'm grateful for magazines and news articles and Google. I'm grateful for colleges and universities. And all those things are helpful and valuable. I'm all for learning and for education. But none of these things can teach us what the Bible can teach us, isn't that right? Because every source of information outside of the Bible will always be man's ideas, man's thoughts, man's opinions on things. And, and again, many of those things are useful, but the Bible is God's thoughts. It's God's ideas. It's God's revelation to us. And that is the thing that will help us as believers navigate our way through a world that is becoming more and more ungodly. And we also see that uh, Daniel was very much in tune with current circumstances in his day. And it wasn't because he spent his time scrolling through social media. It's simply because he regularly read and studied the word. In fact, he says there in that passage, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord. You know, I want to just encourage you today if if you want to know more about anything that's worth knowing in life, go to the Bible as your first source. If you want to learn how to manage finances better, there's wonderful information in the Word. If you're a business person, you want to do business better, get into the Word. If you want to learn how to do marriage better or how to be a better parent, how to do relationships better, get in the Word because what you need for that is contained in the passages of Scripture. So Daniel was a man of the word, but secondly, Daniel was a man of prayer. And we've seen through a number of these chapters that we've looked at, uh, that Daniel had a regular habit of spending time with God daily in prayer. In fact, that passage says, the, uh, Daniel uh, notes that I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting. You know, I think every person who desires to know God or, or to be used by God or to serve God in some capacity, you need to be like Daniel in the sense that you're a person of the word and that you're also a person of prayer. Because I tell you what will happen if you're not, you will end up becoming disconnected with God. There are many Christians who, who, who love the Lord, but they're actually disconnected from him because they never spend time in the word and they never intentionally make time to be with God in prayer. And bear in mind that Daniel was in a foreign land. And in fact, for almost 70 years, he'd been in this foreign land. 
He was away from his people. He was away from his community. He was away from the regular scriptures that he had access to. And yet Daniel still stayed faithful to God. Why? Because he stayed connected to God through the word and through prayer. Now, it's interesting as Daniel says uh, in that passage then, verse 2, he says that from, he finds out from reading the writings of Jeremiah that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. And that would also be the same amount of time for which Israel would end up being in exile in Babylon. And uh, the very passage or the scripture that Daniel would have read to find this out is actually Jeremiah 29 verse 10. And this is what Daniel would have read. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. So Daniel reads that in scripture, and then very interestingly, the Bible says that he begins to plead with the Lord in prayer. Now you would think, well, why does Daniel plead with God in prayer if God's already said what he's going to do? Well, clearly God will do what needs to be done. But the reason for that is that there were three possible dates for that 70-year exile period to be completed because the original exile took place in three different stages. So the first stage of the exile was in 605 BC when Daniel and his friends were taken into captive. Then eight years later, Jerusalem was invaded again and all the treasuries were taken out of the temple to Babylon. And then another 10 years after that was the third and the final wave when Jerusalem was finally conquered and all the nation of Israel was taken into exile. And so Daniel, through prayer here, is really appealing to the mercy of God to make the 70-year exile period end according to the first wave of the exile. So, so Daniel is asking God for mercy to release them 18 years earlier rather than 18 years later. And it's quite an amazing prayer because if you go to the book of Ezra, you find that God actually released them from exile according to the first wave. So clearly this prayer that Daniel prayed on behalf of his nation was both heard and answered by God. You know, as I read that earlier this week, I, you know, I thought may, maybe that's the prayer that we need to pray for our country. You know, because often we don't even know what to pray for South Africa. And, but, but maybe it's time for us to begin to pray, Lord, show mercy to our nation. Because I tell you what, church, our country's not in a good way. You know, there's much that is still good and there's so much to be grateful for. But there are many, many issues and challenges and deep-rooted problems in our country. And, and, you know, this week, again, you would have probably got an SMS from your bank uh, to tell you that if you've got a home loan or a car loan or any other loan, your repayments have now gone up again because the interest rate jumped by a huge 0.75%. So now you are paying more for the same thing than you were paying last week. You know, I read an article that said that one third of South Africans are now earning less in 2022 than they were in 2019. Now, now normally what happens is each year you earn a little bit more and you kind of keep up with the expense of things. So one third of South Africans are earning less than what they did three years ago. And yet the cost of everything has increased by about a third since three years ago as well. So this gap between what people are earning and what the cost of living is, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Then another article I read said that uh, many South Africans are now turning to gambling and dealing in cryptocurrencies to try and make up some of the money that they've lost. But how many of you know that is never the wisest decision to do. And so, you know, can I encourage us all, like Daniel, let's turn to God in prayer on behalf of our nation and maybe let's begin to pray for God's mercy on our country and also for it to come sooner rather than later. Can you say amen to that? Then, verse 4, Daniel says, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed. And now we come to this wonderful prayer that Daniel prays. And, you know, again, sometimes when we pray for our country, we don't always know what to pray. 
I tell you what, this prayer is a great example of how we can intentionally pray for our country and commit South Africa to, the God, to God. Let's, let's have a read of Daniel's prayer from verse 4. He says, O oh Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You always fulfill your covenant and keep your promises of unfailing that love to those who love you and obey your commands. But we have sinned and done wrong. I think that's true of our nation. We have rebelled against you and scorned your commands and regulations. We have refused to listen. Lord, you are in the right. But as you see, our faces are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. But the Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, for we have not followed the instructions he gave. Verse 12, you have kept your word and done to us and our rulers exactly as you have warned. Yet we have refused to seek mercy from the Lord our God by turning from our sins and recognizing his truth. Therefore, the Lord has brought upon us the disaster he prepared. The Lord our God was right to do all these things, for we did not obey him. O Lord our God, we have sinned and are full of wickedness. Quite an amazing prayer that Daniel prays here. He, he acknowledges the righteousness of God, the goodness of God, and then he confesses his own sins and the sins of his nation before the Lord. You know, really what Daniel is saying here is, Lord, you are right and we are wrong. You are holy and we are wicked. You are good and we are everything but good. Now, the Bible commentator David Guzik says of this that uh, Daniel confesses the sin of his people and glorifies the goodness and righteousness of God. You know, I don't know if you've realized as a, as a world and as a society, we've done the exact opposite of that. We tend to glorify the sins of man and then we tear down the righteousness of God. Isn't that right? So if you look at the world around us today, well, the world glorifies self-worship on social media. You know, you put those pictures of yourself there and everyone likes, likes, likes and tells you how awesome you are. And then the world tears down those who do worship God, those who do stand for what is right. You know, the world glorifies evolution so much so that we put it in all the school curriculums around the world. And then we tear down God's creation account in scripture, you know, the world now glorifies homosexuality and it tears down God's stance on marriage and on how relationships should be done. You know, the world glorifies abortion now. We've seen this in America in particular and it tears down the sanctity of life as prescribed in scripture. You know, the world tears down or sorry, glorifies everyone's decision to determine their own version of what they believe to be true. And then it tears down those who stand on God's version of truth according to Scripture. But what makes this wonderful prayer of Daniel so powerful is that he prays it from this place of complete humility. Daniel prays to God, if you like, from a, from a low place. Now, how many of you are rugby fans? Any rugby fans? Man, we need more of you now, more rugby fans in church. I wonder if, if Manchester United played rugby, would you be a rugby fan? <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But in rugby, there's something called the scrum. And this is when the two forward packs come together to basically push each other so that they can get the ball again. And the key to scrumming well is that you have to start from a low point. Because when you start from a low point, it gives you leverage against the other scrum, and it actually gives power to you to dominate them. If you scrum from a high point where your body's in a higher position, you actually lose power, and then you give the advantage to the opposition. And you know, I think the same is true when we come before God. We need to come before God from a low position, a place of humility, if you like. Because when we do so, it gives us leverage with God and it gives us power over the enemy who is always trying to dominate us through sin. Can I just remind you, if you want your prayers to be heard by God, 
Make sure you pray from a low position. Pray, pray with a humble spirit. Don't come before God with this thing. Lord, I'm just going to tell you that you need to do what I'm asking you. You know, don't come like that before God because he's not going to answer you. Come like Daniel with a humble spirit. Come before God from a low position and see the wonderful answers to your prayers that God brings. Can you say amen to that? Then verse 18, Daniel says, we make this plea, not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. Oh Lord, hear. Oh Lord, forgive. Oh Lord, listen and act for your own sake. Do not delay. Oh my God, for your people and your city bear your name. Yeah, we see Daniel again appealing to the mercy of God. And if you've forgotten what mercy is, mercy is simply not getting what we do deserve from the Lord. Daniel basically saying, Lord, we deserve judgment. We deserve the punishment. We deserve your wrath. We deserve your anger. We deserve all these things. However, Lord, would you show mercy to us as your people because without you, we are actually done for. Church, I hope you are grateful for the mercy of God in your life. That because of Christ Jesus, we can come as imperfect, messed up people before a perfectly holy God and not actually get what we deserve, but we receive grace and forgiveness instead because of the mercy of God that has been extended to us. Verse 20, Daniel says, I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people, pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. I love you. We see that Daniel was both consistent and persistent in prayer. You know, it says he pleaded with the Lord. He didn't just pray as we often do those quick help me Jesus prayers. I mean, trouble help me Jesus. And then we think we've done our praying. No, no, the Bible says he continued to pray with the, to the Lord until he got the answer that he needed. And it's a wonderful way to pray. Verse 21, as I was praying, Gabriel, who I'd seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. Now, who was this Gabriel? Well, I tell you, it wasn't Gabriel on our worship team. I mean, he's an awesome guy, but it wasn't him. This was actually Gabriel, the angel. And not just any angel, this was the same Gabriel who a number of hundred years later would actually announce to Mary that she would become the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't think it was a coincidence that Gabriel was sent to Daniel because as we'll see in a few moments, Gabriel was about to announce to Daniel the exact time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it seems from Scripture that when announcements get to be made about Jesus, that Gabriel the angel is the one who gets to be the deliverer of that message. Verse 22, Gabriel explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began praying, a command was given. You know, I don't know about you, but I've always found that to be one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible. Because it reminds us that when we pray, God responds. The moment Daniel began to pray, God began to do something. It doesn't say that the moment he began to pray, God gave him the exact answer. But it tells us the moment he prayerfully and humbly came before the Lord, God began to orchestrate things so that over time he would be able to give Daniel the answer that he was trusting the Lord for. Can I just encourage you today, if, if you are still waiting for your answer from God, don't assume that God hasn't heard your prayer and don't assume that God's not interested in what you're asking for. The moment you began to pray with a humble spirit, God began to work things out so that he can give you the answer that you need. Can you say amen to that? Verse 23 goes on to say, uh, Gabriel says, and now I'm here to tell you what it was for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so that you can understand the meaning of your vision. You know, what a wonderful personal encouragement that must have been for Daniel. Remember, he'd been in exile for nearly 70 years. And I, you know, as, as much as Daniel loved the Lord and, and as much as he stayed faithful to God, I have no doubt there would have been many times when Daniel must have thought, yo, 
Lord, have you forgotten me? Lord, do you know that I'm still in exile? Lord, when are things going to change? And God sends the angel Gabriel to personally deliver a message to Daniel. And he says to him, Daniel, you are very precious to God. And I wonder perhaps whether some of you here today are maybe feeling, man, has the Lord forgotten me? Has God overlooked me? Does he know what's happening? Well, can I just encourage you with the same thing today? You are very precious to God. God knows, God sees, he hasn't forgotten you, you haven't been overlooked, but would you like Daniel, make sure that you intentionally draw close to God and he will give you the answer that you need. Then we jump to verse 24 and, and now we begin to see that Gabriel starts to give Daniel insight into the coming of the Messiah. And again, this, these next few verses are again some of those tricky passages similar to the ones that we looked at last week. But, but let's have a look. Verse 24, Gabriel says that a period of 70 sets of seven. In other words, 70 times seven years. Now, I know you're the bright group that comes at 9.30. Let's test your math, 70 times seven. It's not 156. Someone, someone there said 156. It's 490, okay, we agree. 490, so a period of 490 years has been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin, to atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision and to anoint the holy place. So Gabriel's saying that within this period of 490 years, by the end of it, listen, things are gonna be very different from what they are today. He's saying the rebellion of God's people will be dealt with, sin will be done away with, uh, atonement would have been made for the guilt of people, and the kingdom of God will now be fully ushered in. In other words, there's a whole new era that is coming. You know, even though it would, uh, Israel would be released from that particular exile within a couple of years. Uh, Gabriel was just reminding Daniel that it would actually take another 490 years before they would truly be set free because only then would the kingdom of God be fully ushered in. Then verse 25, Gabriel says, now listen and understand. Yeah, he has another math sum here. This is a more difficult one. Seven sets of seven... In other words, 49 plus 62 sets of seven, 434. I know some of you knew that immediately. Totaling to 483 years, okay? So in other words, he's saying 483 years will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, the Messiah, Jesus, if you like, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and strong defenses despite the perilous times. So the prophecy given here is that 483 years will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah makes himself known. Now that time when that command was given turned out to be almost 100 years later during the time of Nehemiah. And I want us to read this passage because it ties in with this. Nehemiah 2 verse 1. He writes, in the following spring, in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. But I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad for the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried, obviously the city of Jerusalem. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, how long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. 
Now, at this time of Nehemiah, the temple itself had already been rebuilt in Jerusalem. That began once the people came out of exile. But this command to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, historians have given this date as the 14th of March, 445 B.C. Okay, now it's important to note that that, that prophecy had said that 483 years will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah is made known to us. Now, if we jump forward to the New Testament, you might remember in Matthew chapter 2 that it says the wise men had come from the east. They had followed the star and they were looking for the Messiah. They had very obviously read this prophecy, and so there was an expectation that it was about to be fulfilled. Then we see again in Luke chapter 2, just after Jesus' birth, that both Simeon the prophet and Anna the prophetess also mentioned that they had eagerly been awaiting the arrival of the Messiah. So there was an expectation amongst the Jewish people that the Messiah would be coming soon. Now, A guy by the name of Sir Robert Anderson, he was the second assistant commissioner of the London Metropolitan Police from 1888 to 1901. He was a writer, but also a very well-respected Bible theologian. And he wrote a book called The Coming Prince. And in this book, he writes of Daniel that during the time of Daniel's day, Israel actually worked on a 360-day calendar rather than a 365-day per year calendar as we do today. And then working through these days with, you know, he he actually figured out that, that 483 years equates to 173,880 days. And the reason that big number is so significant is because the most reliable Bible commentaries actually say that this 483 period ended. So from the time the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem, it ended on the exact day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey at what we know as the triumphal entry, which was a week before his crucifixion. And this is also, interestingly, the only time in the Gospels where Jesus openly presented himself as the Messiah to the people. You know, often when Jesus healed people or delivered them, he would often tell them to not say anything to anyone about who he was. But here we see with this triumphal entry that Jesus intentionally orchestrated these events. Remember, he said to his disciples, go and tie the donkey, find the donkey, bring it to me. Jesus rode into Jerusalem in public view, and the Bible says that he received the praise and the worship of the people, which was something he hadn't done at any other time. And so Jesus deliberately reveals himself as the Messiah to the people. Now, the reason I share all this with you is because we again see the incredible accuracy of these prophecies of Daniel right down to the exact day that the Messiah would reveal himself to us. And church, I want to encourage you again that you can have complete confidence in Scripture. Don't let people tell you the Bible is just another book. It's just a book of fairy stories and this and that. The Bible is the infallible word of God. It can be trusted for every single area of your life. Now, verse 26 says, After this period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood and war, and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. Now, again, we know from Scripture that Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, he was killed. He was crucified by the Romans. And at his death, Scripture tells us that many were disappointed. You know, his disciples were discouraged. Uh, His followers had said, We thought he was the Messiah. We hoped he would be the anointed one. And then obviously when he revealed himself having been raised from the dead, well, that perspective changed. But that verse goes on to say that a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. Now, history again shows us 
that the temple and Jerusalem were both destroyed in 70 AD. And what had happened, the Romans were oppressing the Jews. They were overtaxing them again. And so a group of Jews decided to revolt against the Romans. Unfortunately, they were no match for the powerful Roman army. The Romans, under the leadership of a guy called General Titus, completely crushed the Jews. And uh, many Jewish people were actually crucified at that time. Thousands of them had said, so much so that they eventually ran out of wood to make more crosses because of all these crucifixions taking place. Uh, many Jews were then sold into slavery again as well. And much like during the time of Antiochus that we looked at last week, there was again immense suffering and persecution among the Jews. Now, there's one more verse uh, in chapter 9 that we're going to look at. It's the last verse of chapter 9. And just before we do, I just need to remind you of what we said last week and just recap some of the things we've said this morning to bring context to it. Uh, last week, Daniel chapter 8, uh, we looked at the, the prophecy that spoke of the desecration of the temple that we know from history took place in 168 BC when this guy Antiochus uh, defiled the temple. And we said that he was a, he's referred to as the Old Testament Antichrist and kind of like a foreshadow of the end times Antichrist. And we also said that that prophecy would be twice fulfilled. It was fulfilled in his life and it would be fulfilled at the end of time. And then remember this morning we said that Gabriel spoke to Daniel of this 490 year period that would take place until the kingdom of God was fully ushered in. And then he also mentioned that it would be 483 years from the time the command was given to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah makes himself known. So again, if your maths are good, you know that 490 minus 483 still leaves you with this outstanding seven-year gap in history. Now, many Bible scholars believe that this last seven years will actually be the final seven years of human history. Uh, it kind of the, 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 the one guy used an example to say, if you imagine God had a big stopwatch, and when that command was given to rebuild Jerusalem, the stopwatch started, then when Jesus revealed himself as the Messiah 483 years later, it was stopped again, waiting to be started up again. And this next verse of Daniel chapter 9 seems to be a reference to this and to the end times that will come. Verse 27, Gabriel says that the ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven, in other words, seven years, but after half this time, three and a half years, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured out on him. So again, yeah, the Bible speaks of this, this antichrist type figure who will once again defile the temple. Now we know from history that this hasn't happened yet simply because when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, well, it's never been rebuilt again since then. So this has to be something for a future time. That passage also says that this ruler will make a treaty with the people. Now, the people obviously referring to the Jews because they were the people in the day of Daniel. And uh, as many of you would know, the area in the world that throughout history has been the biggest political hotspot is the area we know, Israel and Palestine. Okay, throughout history, we've had Jews and Arabs living side by side there. And there has always, from the Bible days, been tension between these people. And what you know, makes it even worse is that on the current site where the temple was built is actually what is now known as the Dome of the Rock, which is the oldest surviving Islamic structure and it's also a holy site for the Muslims. So you can imagine for the Jews there how this must irk them, knowing that this uh, Arab structure is on that site of the temple there. 
And, uh, you know, it would seem, as we spoke about last week in, in part seven, that there would be this ruler who would potentially come out of the area that today we know as Europe, who would somehow make this peace treaty between Jews and Arabs, allowing for the temple to be rebuilt on that same site. Because this end times defiler can't desecrate the temple without there actually being a temple. So the temple has to be rebuilt again. And many Bible commentators believe that once this treaty is made, that that prophetic stopwatch will start ticking again to usher in the last seven years of human history. And that halfway through it, so three and a half years in, this so-called peacemaker will then actually reveal his true colors and be revealed as the end times antichrist and the persecution towards the Jews will again begin. And like Antiochus in 168 BC, he will once again defile the temple until the end comes. You know, if we, if we look at the world around us today, I'll tell you what, the world is ready for a peacemaker like that. You know, with all the wars and everything that is happening, the world is ripe for someone to stand in that gap there. To be able to do what no one else in history has done and to be able to make peace and unite the Jews and Arabs together. Now, we don't know exactly when this will happen. We don't know exactly how it will happen. We don't know if it will happen exactly in this way. But, but this seems to be the clearest understanding of the Scripture. And so what is our response as believers? Well, our response is simply to make sure that every day we live ready for when the Lord comes back, that we are not caught unaware and unprepared for the coming of the Lord and for the end. And like Jesus who said, Matthew 25, 13, so you too must keep watch for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. I know that was some more deep teaching today, but listen, these passages are in the Bible for a reason. Amen. Come, let's stand to our feet. We're gonna worship. And then we'll pray and be done in a few moments.